talk today. Um, I'm I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to meet you. I'm I'm so excited because today is the actual uh, 100th anniversary of the life uh, of Mary Easter Reed. Actually, it's the day she died 100 years ago. So, uh, for you to extend this invitation to me and to this. Um, um, I, I'm going to say wonderful book. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing for the author to call her own book wonderful, but the production is so gorgeous. I have to call it wonderful. Uh, and um, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and my dear friend, Kathy Foster, also said that she um, uh, moderated a conversation with you. I think I, I can't remember. It's all bleeding into my mind, but she... <laughs> She was excited about it too. Oh yes, she 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 was just wonderful and gave me some information I wish was in the book, but I'm going to share it all with you. Um, uh, she was moderating the conversation at the Art Gallery of Ontario because this is a very much a binational project. Because uh, Mary used to read, of course, was born in the in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, but uh, produced a lot of her art in Canada as well as in the Catskill Mountains. You're gonna see me slightly disappear from my screen because I wanna grab my book. Well, Molly, thank you. And I remember now one of the reasons I was so excited about this is I too am a binational product. Uh, I grew up in Montreal, Canada. I was born there. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my so, um, and I'm very interested in, I'm also a British citizen. So I, I have a lot of these interests, 19th century and, so we're so excited that you came today. I'm gonna to let Abby take over, but I'm really thrilled that even though we just sort of got this on the calendar, look, we're up to 46 participants. So I think that's a testament to the interest in your work. Um, uh, well, th th thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I too was worried. I thought, oh no, people won't have enough time to respond, but um, this woman is generating a lot of interest now, so I'm really thrilled. Yeah, thank you so much, Molly and Anna. That's a perfect way to kickstart our program today, since I want to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from you and also hear from our lovely audience. Um, we're up to 50 now. It's so, so nice to see so many of you. Um, I recognize a lot of folks on this call, but I also see some new people. So welcome to Art at Noon. If this is your first time here, I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs. And I wanna to start today by respectfully acknowledging that I, along with our institution and many of our attendees are speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Lenape Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. I also have to mention the people that make free programs like this possible at PAFA. Um, the Fall Art at Noon lectures are supported by the Barron family in memory of Rose Susan Horshorn Barron, a former docent at the Academy and a great supporter of education programs. So thank you, especially to the Barrons. Just a few details regarding the program. We will be recording or we are recording and I'll be sharing this later on Papa's YouTube channel. I will drop a link to that momentarily if you know of anyone who missed today's fantastic program. Um, I know it's a busy time for all of us, so that's why we record these, so we can share them and they can live on there. We will have time at the end, save for thoughts and questions, but please feel free to drop things in the chat as we go. I love already seeing some commentary about how many men we'll have in this meeting from Chris, hopefully some, but it's also nice to see a great a great group of women supporting women's scholarship. Um, but again, please drop, feel free to drop feel free to drop things in the chat as we go and know that I will be reading them out to our speaker at the end. I also have to mention, we have a lot of exciting things coming up both virtually and in person at PAFA. Our whole fall season for Art at Noon is now up. It features everything from female sculptors um, creating giant frogs that still live in Rittenhouse Park to the visual, a short history of the nude and visual art and everything in between. So please feel free to check that out. We also have um, an in-person tour of a new exhibition, Linger and Flow, that's um, happening this Saturday. It's a limited amount since it's in-person, but feel free to grab a spot while there still are um, spots open. And then we also have a program tomorrow night featuring several PAPA alums, including Clarity Haynes, 
who are going to be discussing their decade-long friendships and connection to pop up tomorrow evening, which is also free. So please keep a lookout on our events calendar. We'd love to see you all at all of the things going on in this busy, busy time. So I'm now so proud to introduce our speaker today. Molly Peacock is a biographer and a poet, a fellow of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. She's the author of two biographies, Flower Diary, Mary, um, Heister. Am I saying that right, Mary? Easter. Molly? Easter. Hey, Easter. Thank you. I was like, I heard you say it. And I was like, I'm going to screw it up. Mary <laughs> Easter read, um, paints, travels and marries and opens a door. And, um, like our speaker mentioned today is the exact anniversary of her death. So this is the hundredth anniversary, if you will, of her life. And we are so, so excited to be able to share this, um, this wonderful day with all of you. Um, Peacock is also the author of The Paper Garden, Miss Delaney Begins Her Life's Work at 72, which was named a book of the year by The Economist, The Globe and the Mail, Booklist, The London Evening Standard, among many others. Peacock has spent the last eight years writing and researching her biography of Reed in awe of this incredible visual artist of the past who seemed to hold keys to how we love and work today. Peacock's latest poetry collection is The Analyst, poems from W.W. W. Norton and Company. She teaches online for Utenberg Poetry Center at the 92nd Street Y in New York City and lives in Toronto. So please join me in welcoming our fabulous speaker today. Molly, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I really want to thank PAFA for uh, inviting me to speak about one of its alums, an alumna, uh, who graduated in 1885. Uh, and uh, I just want to give a few shout outs to people uh, because there are, there, there's, uh, there are poets, um, visual artists, uh, lovers of art, uh, floral, still lifes, lovers of landscapes who are here in this audience. Uh, I, I see that there's um, uh, the writer, um, Rachel Gabriel is here, another writer, Ona Gritz from the Philadelphia area, Abigail Garner, another writer, Godfrey Jordan, the filmmaker, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Nina Zucker, a writer, um, uh, Kate Newman, Thel Thelma Rosner, uh, a painter, uh, Davidson Garrett, uh, a wonderful poet from New York City, and I'm sure I'm missing a few, but I just sort of went through and saw all of the creative talent that uh, has gathered here uh, to hear a little bit about Flower Diary and Mary He's to Read. And so before I share my screen, I just want to say that Mary He's to Read is the name you should know. She was an amazing 19th and early 20th century painter of luscious floral still lifes a couple of which are behind me today. Um, <clears throat> and she was one of the first generations of women painters to get married and not stop painting. <clears throat> She's a foremother of the Georgia O'Keeffe generation. She was an impressionist, a tonalist, and a realist all at once, producing over 300 oil paintings. She's an American from a prominent family in Reading, Pennsylvania, but she married the Canadian artist George Agnew Reed, and the two lived and painted in Toronto, but they maintained a studio in New York's Catskill Mountains uh, at an art colony called Antiora. Mary studied in Paris, wrote and painted throughout Spain, sailing to Europe five times, often creating emotional paintings of three subjects three trees, three roses. Oh, and one last thing. She and her husband lived in a loose menage with a talented younger painter, Mary Evelyn Wrench. So uh, let me enrich this story a little bit more for you by sharing my screen and giving you a, a little bit of a visual sense of what her paintings were about and what her life is about. So I'll share my screen and Okay. 
Um, and just to say in the in the in the beginning that this book it, it is a full biography, but I'm just showing in my little window here. Um, it uh, is amazingly produced because there are 34 chapters, and each of the 34 chapters is preceded by an image. Here's Mary. This is the first image in the book, and here she is in her Paris studio. Uh, she did go to PAFA, but after she left PAFA, she and uh, her husband went to Paris, and they went to Paris a number of times, but um, the, she also enrolled in the studio Colorossi, and this is a picture taken by her husband of that time, and you can see her in a French dress uh, with a, a wonderful, a wonderful ribbon, um, be, you know, sort of combined with the details of this dress, and you can see her studio and paintings that she admired, uh, that she was reproducing at the time. Here's a little bit of a, 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 a detail of a painting uh, called Studio in Paris that she painted during the time that she, um, that you see her in this photograph. Here's the first painting. I'm gonna stay on the slide for a while. Here's the first painting that I encountered um, by her. And I was uh, researching a book on botanical artists, but I was asked to give uh, a talk about one single painting at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I was so frustrated with my research on botanical artists. I said, well, have you got any flower paintings by women? Uh, in the 19th century, and the curator Georgiana Oyarik led me to this painting. And I began looking at it, and I, this is extremely luscious if you uh, get up close to it. These, these whites are pinks, these petals are like, uh, have the quality of lingerie. I'm looking at these sensuous roses, and I'm seeing three objects that, that uh, big, uh, um, metal pewter plate in the background, the um, medium-sized jug, the smaller jug, and seeing these three groups of flowers, three objects, um, painting divided into three horizontally. And I asked the curator, I said, well, what's with all the triangulation in this painting? And uh, she said, well, I'll tell you a story. Uh, but then she was busy and uh, left the room. And I didn't find out about the story behind all of these triangles for quite a while. But I just want to point out to you that these objects in the, in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century were gendered objects. Uh, the idea of, of, of this kind of a jug uh, would have been identified as a more matronly female kind of jug. This is the younger jug, a small milk jug. These ordinary household, household objects had stories attached to them, iconography attached to them. So, and you can see all of these grays. This is a painting called A Study in Grays. And Mary Hester Reed was influenced by James Whistler who uh, in, um, in his uh, 10 o'clock speech, um, quite some time before she painted this painting because she painted this in 1913, uh, using principles from 1885 and also using tonalist ideas that came into circulation more in the 1890s and in at the first part of the 20th century. So what is this? There's a, 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 an overlaying of styles. There is uh, a, a sense, uh, this sensuous sense. There's a slightly biographical sense in here. Uh, and it's painted just about in the year that modernism exploded on the American scene with the Armory Show. Mary Hester Reed did not have one single interest in modernism. She was interested in time and interested in emotion. Here is an interior that she painted, an interior of her studio 
in Witchwood Park. And this is done uh, at about the same time. Uh, and this studio is very much preserved. People live here now, but these objects in this painting are, are, are present in this house. There's been quite a stewardship of the life of Mary Heaster Reed in Toronto. And uh, here's just a, a little uh, uh, a silhouette uh, of one of her Muhlenberg ancestors, uh, labeled grandmother in her handwriting. And uh, I should stop here to, to say that it's wonderful to be with an American audience uh, and a, a Philadelphia audience who would recognize the names of uh, Heaster, Muhlenberg, Clymer, uh, Musser. These are the her family names. And she was born into a family of a certain kind of pro prominence. She didn't have, I think, a, a spectacular amount of money but she had a little bit of money and this sense of family because her uh, she had an ancestor who was there at the founding of the Philadelphia Museum of Art other and and her father uh, of course is there at the founding of, uh, of a prominent medical school and so there, she has many, many ties in the Philadelphia area. And I'm so excited to be speaking to you because maybe there's someone among you who actually is a descendant. It would be a lateral descendant because she did not have children. Here is, this is a, a little postcard size sketch um, of uh, an impressionist, um, an impressionist influenced work that she did uh, later on that is in a collection in Canada. And I use this to begin the chapter about her childhood. And I'll tell you a little tiny bit about that. She was born in 1854 uh, and died in 1921 on October 4th. Uh, just after she was born, only five months after she was born, her father died. Her father was a physician and a prominent one and a naturalist. So plants are in, in, in her genes, so to speak. And she is also the descendant um, of uh, a man who's called the American Linnaeus, a, a, a plant collector uh, who uh, arrived um, in the United States uh, just before the Revolutionary War. And her, the, the sense of her belonging to Philadelphia, um, belonging to Pennsylvania is a very, very deep one. She had one older sister. And here we have the triangulation again, we've got a jack pine tree and two prominent younger blooming trees. Um, and we'll just leave them as the Civil War begins to approach uh, Gettysburg. And we'll stop here at a painting called Night, Nightfall. As the Civil War starts to uh, come, come up into Pennsylvania, and she has relatives, female relatives who are rolling bandages, sewing uniforms. Uh, her mother is obviously very aware of this war and, her, and she's alone. She's got two girls, uh, she's in her forties. And so she decides to take these two girls to Beloit, Wisconsin. So when Mary's about nine years old and her sister is about 10, they go to Beloit and um, which is a, a brand new community uh, and uh, formed by um, Yale University alums who go there to uh, ignore the people who have lived on this land for hundreds uh, and thousands of years and to immediately start a lumber uh, business. Uh, but she grows up there and just holds her with her mother and ask yourself, how does a woman grow up to become a painter, 
get married, still do all of her work as an artist while supporting her husband's work. So just have that question in the back of your mind and think about Mary Cassatt, who goes to Paris. She's much wealthier than Mary used to read, but she lives with her parents. Mary used to read wants a fully adult life. How, how did that happen? <laughs> uh, and uh, um, just as you hold that in your mind, take a look at this painting. Here is a tonalist painting also done by Mary in these grades. Grace, it is a nighttime painting and tonalism, uh, some of you of course uh, know, know this very well, but for the, for, the, for the poets of the audience who may not uh, necessarily know what tonalism is, it is uh, a style of painting that is identified with musical tones. And often in the titles, there are words like harmony, symphony, um, uh, sonata, and it is identified with emotion. And these emotions are the subtler kinds of emotions that occur at low light times of day, twilight, early morning, drizzling rain. Uh, so all of the foggy quote unquote, poetic times of day. And Mary Heaster Reed was identified by critics throughout her life as a poetic painter. Now, let's get her back to, um, let's get her back to Philadelphia. She grows up in Wisconsin, uh, her father's long dead, her mother dies. She's 21 uh, and, uh, her sister leaves town almost immediately, perhaps to go on a European tour. And, um, you know, in, in the, the idea that they'll, they'll, find her, they'll find her a husband if they take her to Europe and um, mar marry her off to someone there, but she doesn't uh, get married. She instead converts to Catholicism and becomes a Roman Catholic nun and never returns to North America again leaving her younger sister to settle her mother's estate. And the minute she does that, she races back to Philadelphia and takes her a few years to adjust. We don't know a lot about her life in that during that time, but then in 1883, ends up at the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, the sponsor of this talk, where, uh, George, where she meets George Reed, who is painting paintings like this. If you take a look at these nudes, these are nude models, uh, and we know that they're, uh, we conjecture that they're painted at PAFA because these women are where, this is probably the same woman wearing masks. And these nudes uh, are done um, in the classes of Thomas Aikens. And I'll come back to this in a, in, in a minute. Here is Alice Barber's Grisai of um, uh, a, a women's painting class um, that was in Scrib Scribner's Monthly, a very widely circulated mag magazine at the time. And you could see um, this female model. And this is Susan McDowell. Uh, a classmate of Mary Heaster Reed's who uh, eventually marries Thomas Aikens and stops painting. So just hold that in your mind too, because she stops. She marries a much more distinguished older painter and of course then um, uh, ceases her career. But Mary Heaster Reed doesn't do that. She's, here, here is a wonderful photograph of um, a modeling class at uh, at PAFA, and I'm, I'm I want to give a shout out to Kathy Foster if she happens to be here, um, uh, the marvelous uh, uh, curator at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, who introduced me to this particular photograph, where 
uh, we see women in classes modeling uh, three-dimensional, uh, not they're maquette-like sculptures, so that when they go to paint, they can give a, a sense of th three dimensions in their work. And Aikens at this time is, here he is, um, a, a, an intense, serious man, uh, a spectacular painter, and in charge only for a three year window at PAFA. You'll, you'll correct me if, I, if, I'm, if I'm incorrect with this idea of three years, but in this three year window, that is when George Reed does everything in Canada to get 500 US greenbacks to come down to Philadelphia to study with this man. And it's where Mary Heaster Reed wants to study with this man also because he is opening up these classes to women. And he is allowing women to, for instance, see a female nude and paint a woman with a body like their own. That Philadelphia and PAFA was the only place in the entire world at this time that a woman could paint a female nude. This was not happening in Paris. And here is a, a, a class around the time that the Reeds um, uh, would, have, uh, uh, would have attended. And my, I keep thinking that perhaps I might be able to identify Mary in here, but I wouldn't say for sure. Here is a painting that uh, Aikens did where you can see George Reed playing his guitar in the background. This again is thanks to Kathy Foster. And here are, here are the masked nudes. And I should say something about this because uh, the women who uh, came to model were not, well, these were women who needed the money. And you, you have to understand that there are very, very few ways for women alone to earn money at this time. So at one, and this, this woman obviously has had a number of children and she comes to PAFA to uh, earn what, what she can for herself by modeling and through uh, uh, this peculiar and interesting sense of modesty wears a mask. And I just point this out as we all, as, as masks have become uh, as so electrically prominent in our own lives in the past few years, the idea of, of hiding the face uh, and to view the body and that we have these done by the man who is going to marry Mary he's to read. Here he is in a portrait that she paints of him some years later, 10 years later. And here she is in a portrait he paints of her as they decide to get married and go off to Europe. Now this looks like a very demure portrait. Um, but to George and Mary and to anyone at the time looking at it, something else is going on. And one of the things that Kathy Foster told me is that women at the time, women students at the PAFA classes were modeling for one another because they wanted to have a sense of painting their own young bodies. And there would be an agreement where one young woman would take off her clothes and model for a group of women. And the deal was that if you took off your clothes and everyone painted you, then they would have to take off their clothes so that you could paint them. And the atmosphere of sensuality at the school at this moment, it's this tiny, tiny window, just a few years because Thomas Aikens is going to be relieved of his responsibilities for creating an atmosphere like this. 
but you see the sensuousness in the portrait of George and you see the influence of Velasquez in this portrait, his George's portrait of Mary, which is on the cover of Flower Diary. Uh, that, and she's in a traveling dress. She's getting ready to go out. And she is dressed from her ankles to her chin. And all of these women are dressed this way. And let me tell you what it's like to be inside these layers of clothes in a corset. I liken it to taking three underwire bras and wrapping them around your, your, your midriff and hooking them up. That's how they're dressed. And they are, of course, they're covering their hands and wearing gloves. And she is wearing a pair of yellow kid skin gloves in this portrait. And now let me introduce you to glove culture of the time. How a woman in the presence of a man or men would remove her gloves, the slowness of it, the slow revelation of her hands is a kind of mini acceptable social striptease. And this is a very sensuous painting. It looks like she is as buttoned up as possible, and she is, but here is her wedding portrait by her husband with the yellow glove striptease. Off they go to Europe, but I just want to see here. Here is a very chaste portrait of Mary Heaster Reed. Uh, here are two jugs that um, that she is painting. Uh, one is a whiskey jug. Uh, a masculine whiskey jug. Here is a milk jug um, of very much identified. This is a very binary culture uh, with, with women um, uh, and their um, fecundity, shall we say. Here's another paint. Uh, George would paint portraits of Mary. She began to model for him. And he, he always paints her as, as um, um, plump and fecund when in fact uh, she was quite a lean person. They go, they establish their studios in Toronto, but Toronto at the time is quite a backwater. They start teaching out of their studio, which is, uh, was uh, only two blocks away from where I live. And so I got quite a sense of her just through our geography. They go to Paris, and become neighbors of Eugene Grasset, who is the who did this work, and, and you all recognize this uh, this image. Uh, and as the father of Art Nouveau, um, he's living next. She's living as a neighbor of his in an artist community there in Paris, and learning a little bit. Just take a look at those roses uh, and how they are outlined. Uh, taking a little tiny bit of this Parisian influence in. Uh, and there is the full image of uh, her Paris studio, that single chair. And then um, the hint of the daybed, the couch. There's always a sensuousness in all of her work throughout her life, different levels of sensuousness. And when they return to Toronto, she models for George again. And this time, uh, you can see this is a bit dark, but there is, uh, here she is. She is Angry Mary here. This is a famous painting in Canada, Canada called Mortgaging the Homestead. And it was used on political posters at the time. Uh, so Mary's face is a, a plastered across newspapers in Canada while an election is going on. And here is uh, the uh, farmer signing away, mortgaging his farm to the banker uh, with his parents, mournfully sitting aside, losing uh, uh, the, the security of their old age with the uh, stern and angry wife 
uh, holding a child, another child looking on. At this point, uh, Mary has been painting lots and lots of flower paintings to sell to, to, to uh, prospective buyers in Toronto and selling her work at about the a tenth of the cost um, of, of her husband's. Her husband, meanwhile, has become extremely prominent. He's very, very well known. He is famous, but she's not unknown. Uh, and this is the time at which she paints, I think, one of her most glorious paintings here, uh, uh, courtesy of the Cooley Gallery in Lyme, Connecticut. This, this is a painting that is still in the United States. And you will see those three very sensuous roses. There are lots of, lots of triangulation in Mary's life, beginning with the threesome of her mother and the two girls. And I should tell you that her mother never remarried. She had her own household. Mary grew up in a household without a man. So there was no Victorian baritone um, uh, establishing rules in this house. There was a woman who was managing money and she managed her money well enough to lend it to other people in Beloit uh, and to have a substantial household. And so this is a painting that uh, we have from 1891 after Mary has fallen in love as many, many, many North Americans have, and certainly people in Europe has fallen in love with objects from Asia. And here is a, a, a wonderful ginger jar. And we know it's a ginger jar because it's got uh, um, a raw rim around it so that the top of the jar can fit on solidly. And three, possibly these are mermet roses. It's tough to exactly identify them, but um, there, there, may, there may be rose admirers, or, or perhaps even a rose historian among you who could tell me a little bit more about this, but I went to the Hort, the Pennsylvania Hort, uh, and spoke to Nicole Jude about this painting, and uh, even she was hesitant. Uh, to completely identify uh, which roses they are. Here's that threesome in this deeply emotional, deeply atmospheric painting. And I, I remind you a quote, Catherine Lochnan, um, uh, a Canadian art historian who says, um, uh, you must remember that nothing in a still life is unintentional. Here are her fabulous chrysanthemums Again, in an Amari bowl, uh, she was an admirer of Velasquez and you see that deep, dark, uh, delicious background and those electric chrysanthemums leaping out of the bowl. Um, uh, I won't say anything more, but you can just take this in a little bit. Um, I see that there are lots of questions and comments in the chat. I can't see the chat, but I'm going to end this so that we can uh, uh, you can uh, ask those questions and, and uh, I can uh, try to answer them. Here is the painting that you see on the wall behind me. And this is a painting called Three Roses. And this is done in 1894, exactly at the moment when uh, a younger painter, 25 years younger than Mary, uh, a very, very talented young painter named Mary Rinch, Mary Evelyn Rinch. And many, many people were named Mary at the time. And I'm going to show you a, 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 a photograph of something called the Mary Luncheon, where everyone who was invited was named Mary uh, in, a, in, a, <laughs> in a couple of slides from here. But just take a look at this. Um, this is a milk jug. Uh, and uh, just you can you can take in um, these three roses, and she often paints three flowers in relation to one another. Often there are two and then one to the side. Here are these weeping petals. Do you think I'm reading too much into this painting? One of the joys of writing this book and following this artist, looking at these paintings, is knowing she was a poetry reader. Uh, 
she was someone who was uh, called a sympathetic realist, meaning uh, a, a, a realist who identified, was identified with her emotions. And the emotions that are evoked, for instance, in music with tonal, uh, um, the idea of tonalism also are at play here. And by the time we've gotten to 1890, art historians have influenced prominent thinkers about projection. Sigmund Freud is on the scene thinking about the process of projection, but it is Alois Regal and the Vienna School philosophers who have thought about uh, projection before him, the idea of how do we insert our emotions into a, into a painting? How does a painting provoke emotions in us? And the word empathy is born from those German philosophers who are contemporaries of Mary Easter Reed uh, and who, who then pass this word and the idea of, of inserting emotions and receiving emotions from art becomes the basis of the psychological idea of projection and the birth of the word empathy. The word actually doesn't get translated uh, into English until the beginning of the 20th century. There's Mary uh, painted by her husband who paints her again throughout their lives. But after he paints her as that angry woman with holding a child and they do not have children. And in the book, I explore all kinds of 19th century birth control um, because I don't know, we, I, I have no idea whether this is a choice or whether this simply happened, but I do know that um, Mary Easter Reed was not a multitasker. And I do feel that um, if she'd had children, um, more than likely she would not have produced 300 of these stunning paintings. So here she is uh, painted by her husband about um, um, at least about nine years after the Angry Mary painting, because when she, after that Angry Mary painting, the mortgaging the homestead, she stops modeling for him. There's some kind of shift. And she stops just as Mary Evelyn Rinch, the younger painter, comes into their lives and they take her with them to Antiora. George start, starts using other models. And um, here is a, another model of a Madonna with a child, uh, a model he, he used often, who looks a little bit like his wife. And here is uh, Mary Evelyn Rinch uh, in a very loving portrait um, done of her. She's about, oh, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. Uh, uh, and this is a portrait by George Reed. Here she is. Uh, in, a, in a photograph so that you um, just get some photographic documentation of this very talented young woman. Uh, and here is another George Reed painted around this time. This is, this is the, the preparatory sketch for a painting that it now is lost. I, I imagine it will surface at some point. Um, uh, again, of, the, of this uh, young woman in Disabi uh, looking toward the horizon with the, the evening star, which is Venus rising in the distance. And uh, we can only ask now um, who positioned her this way um, and who uh, asked her to, uh, who, who arranged these clothes. And this is happening, of course, in George Reed's studio or perhaps at Antiora. Um, so, and there, his, his privilege in, uh, and his choices of subject uh, uh, slowly uh, keep shifting in this, in this relationship. And after this painting, or as he's painting that, 
Mary used to read is painting these other magnificent chrysanthemums. And chrysanthemums, of, uh, of course, are the flower of maturity. They're the flower of autumn. And she's, paint, she's also doing this in a style of Japanese. Um, I'm going to stop, I think, in about one minute, um, just telling you that here is this Japanese um, print uh, of, um, uh, of a fierce, uh, an actor imitating a fierce warrior. And here are three wise men. Uh, and I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, uh, Daniel Chen, who was an expert in uh, Asian ceramics, who gave me a little bit of the information in this painting. So just hold here. I'm going to flip through a few more of these paintings quickly because let's get to the let's get to your questions. A triptych Mary did in Spain because uh, in uh, just after George paints that girl uh, with uh, the bare-breasted girl, Mary gets a job. Um, here is a detail, and you can see the surface of this particular painting. She gets a job. You can see her writing in the background there as George is, is uh, illustrating a three-part travelogue that she wrote. Uh, and by the time she comes back from Spain, visiting her sister, she stops temporarily painting flowers and you see her painting trees. There is a way in which she comes into her voice. She starts writing as well as painting, comes into that voice and suddenly we see uh, portraits of single trees. Uh, here's another painting uh, just to, to show you a landscape, more roses. Here is George. Uh, this is a, one of the very few paintings. You can see it at the Reading Museum. Uh, you can go there. It's close by to Philadelphia. And here is George's painting of Mary as, they, as their marriage comes together again, as their own sensuous closeness reestablishes. Here's that Mary luncheon I was talking about. Every woman in this painting uh, is, is, uh, is called Mary. Here is Mary way in the background in the gray at Antiora, uh, a, an artist colony that was begun by Candace Wheeler. And you can, here's Candace Wheeler, the mother of North American design. And one of the reasons that George and Mary become part of the North American arts and crafts movement. Here's Mary Evelyn Rinch painting outdoors, the younger painter. Uh, and two of her quite amazing works, um, uh, which, and a, por a portrait of Mary Heaster, read that Mary Rinch does. So I'll just stop there and we'll take a look at these nasturtiums. Uh, and I think I'll, I will stop here uh, and uh, ask Abby to stop my screen share so that we can answer some questions. Of course. Wow. Thank you so much, Molly, for that whirlwind tour. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, and the chat is alive with, with love for, for all of those amazing paintings. Um, I, I do want to mention, so folks, feel free to drop in more questions, and I'm going to read them out loud to our speaker. I did want one of our active members of the chat is my colleague, Dr. Anna O'Marley. And I wanted to see if, Anna, if you had anything um, you'd like to share just because there's so many amazing connections to an exhibition you have um, up. So hold on, I'm going to allow you to unmute. Thank you so much, um, Abby, and thank you so much, Molly. That was fantastic, and I'm so excited to see all the conversations. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the reasons we were particularly thrilled to have you talk is because of all of the connections related to our current exhibition, Women in Motion, 150 Years of Women's Artistic Networks at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. So, you know, I, I chimed in a bunch of times, many of the artists that you mentioned, including, including Susan McDowell Akins and Alice Barber Stevens, 
Mary Cassatt, uh, they're all on view right now. And we also published a small catalog, which um, maybe if Abby can find the link for the, you can order it online. Um, but you can also come see the, th the show at PEFA through next July. So it's over a hundred, oh, wow. yeah, a hundred works by women artists, uh, works on paper, sculptures, paintings, some great still lives, um, but none by Mary Hester Reed. So I guess I'm going to need to work on that. You've got, yeah. you've got to give yeah. me marching orders. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. One of the fun things about uh, writing this book is to reintroduce Mary Easter Reed to American audiences. Um, she's not terribly well known in Canada either, but at least she's she's been collected in Canada and her work can be found um, in major museums up here. So um, that it, it's wonderful, all of these connections. And I, I just have to mention all the connections to Antiora in the Catskill Mountains that Candace Wheeler, Wheeler was a powerful, powerful um, a force for women's art, especially at, during the Chicago exposition. And I'm just going to, I wanted to sort of show you a tiny bit about this book uh, that um, it is, I mean, there, there are uh, images that begin each one of the chapters and there are interludes and you probably can't quite see this in this sort of wonderful um, uh, Prescott Green, I think it's called. Uh, and uh, these interludes are uh, uh, interludes from my own life because um, this is a book about a woman and her marriage and how she accommodates this third party, which she does. Um, both by running away from her, going to Europe, and by settling into a relationship where these two women actually show together, uh, and and how all of that evolves, I uh, asked my husband to follow in her footsteps with me, and the interludes record our um, relationship, our long marriage, our responses to of uh, the marriage of uh, Mary and George and uh, and that the intrusion of the third woman, which in our case uh, wasn't a third person, but um, something else. I'll leave it there. That's a great transition too, to a question we have um, from Abigail in the chat um, asking, can you tell us about what agreeing to model for her husband meant emotionally and or transactionally so that we can understand what it may have been communicated when she stopped modeling for him? Well, um, and you could see from the very, and there was an earlier slide of, uh, George Reed modeling for Aikens. People modeled for, model for one another all the time, uh, because the, <laughs> Uh, the tenets of realist painting where they, they wanted to get the real person. And the, this sense of um, trying to get the sen a sense of three-dimensionality and Inkin's edict, which is draw with your brush. So these paintings are not being drawn and then filled in as if they were coloring books. They are being built up on the canvas so her modeling for him is both a, a, an act of wifely duty, a romantic act, because believe me, if you've ever modeled for anyone uh, and they like you, it, it, the feeling of having them, that brush um, touch the canvas, which is like, uh, some mental uh, uh, kinesthetic touching of you as the model. It's a very, very sensuous process. So part of it is it's romantic. She's modeling for them in the beginning, for him in the beginning. He's not modeling for her because she has transferred the figure to the flower. And it's very, very important to know that, that uh, of um, how, how important 
still life is for women because that's one of the things that they are allowed to paint so that human bodies become bodies of flowers. So all this is going on and she's modeling for him. And believe me, for his paintings, she modeled for hours. And when they got to Paris, he immediately started a painting called Dreaming. And there she is as the dreamer um, in, in uh, bringing forward his dreams for himself, embodied in her. And their intimacy gets, gets played out over and over again in paintings where he uses her as a model. And when I saw that last painting of, of, of mortgaging the homestead and then uh, confirmed with uh, um, an expert on this painting that that indeed was Mary, and then when she, when I can find no other record for nine years of her modeling for him, I had, I, uh, it, it spoke to me. I said, okay, I mean, something is going on here. What is it? Um, she goes off into some of the best paintings of her life when she's not modeling for him. And he begins looking to other models and then the third woman comes into their relationship. So I don't feel that I am too far off uh, in, in drawing these uh, conclusions. Thank you, Molly. And we have another art historian colleague um, here with us, Kathleen Foster, who oh! mentioned <laughs> personal inter interludes add a wonderful perspective to this book, along with thoughts about being a woman in this period. So it's a beautifully written book by a poet, lovely to read. So. I also, Kathleen, you put a question in and I, you're welcome to unmute and ask it yourself too, but about a, a painting, particularly in that Parisian um, easel in Paris. And I know she asked if you had been able to locate what that painting was yet. Um, and I hope I haven't you know, that. A little it was bit more direction. Um, mm -hmm. The course it was early on in the presentation um i think it was the one that's like the red room that's in paris oh paris. yes that, oh yes that is that is, that is that is that is in a museum here in canada um uh so so yes i um i can i can tell i can tell you exactly it's right if we go back to the slide in a minute i can i can give you the exact credit um and there is another there she's she's done a number of interiors of rooms and there's another really beautiful one in a private collection i can point you to um uh, uh, per, per, perhaps in an email correspondence and um she's constantly painting these wonderful pillows i mean even when she paints interiors they're very very sensuous you want to sink into these interiors um and um i can I'll, I'll go back and find the reference for you in a in, in a flash as i go on to the next question perfect thank you so much um and we have a question from amanda and i'm curious about this too since i know you spent so much time on this book but did reed leave any personal memoirs or diaries for us to read or, or how are what are some of the ways that you put her story together Okay, um, I'm uh, I'm going to find this reference for for uh, Kathy Foster in a in a second here. Okay, yes, it's at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Um, uh, that painting. So uh, and they are they are um, extremely proud of it and very glad to have it there. Uh, so and this question is just sure. yeah. So Amanda asked. Um, did oh, Mr. Reed yes. leave us any personal memoirs or diaries? No, <laughs> I was told in, in at the very beginning of starting this project, I was said, uh, told by people, you you can't you can't do this. She didn't leave enough of a written legacy, and my response to this is, um, she left some crucial written items there. A very few crucial letters that were saved by a friend of hers. Okay, all of you friends, print out your friends' significant emails, save them from bit rot, and preserve them, please. Because if it weren't for that friend, we wouldn't know, for instance, 
um, that uh, she, one of her last acts was walking down the street to vote. This is a woman whose lifespan um, uh, in, included um, the entire suffrage movement. And so, so for me, uh, at first I thought, oh no, nothing's written. And then I realized so much of her life is preserved in edifices. If I went to see places, if I could walk into Pafa and smell those studios, if I could see those where she lived in Paris, if I could enter the houses she lived in in Toronto, I could walk the streets, if I could track her through Spain, and that's where she we do have her voice in three marvelous long form journalism travel articles uh, where she, where she talks about art, talks about what she saw. We have her voice and we have her voice in those letters. No, there is not a diary that says, I'm so pissed off at George for sleeping with Mary Rinch. There's nothing like that. We can only put together the atmospheres of her life by creating, as I have, a chronology of her life, a chronology of her paintings, a chronology of George's life, of Mary Evelyn Rinch's life, seeing where they are together, where they are apart, tracking them through, writing this triple person biography that is also a biography of a poet looking at paintings and, um, and reading those paintings um, as, um, as, in as intently as, as, as I can, uh, I guess I, I, I would say. And that's what this book is about. It draws from all of these sources tracking the philosophers, uh, uh, tracking the art historians, tracking the psychologists, but collaging together ideas, images, lives. Yeah. Well, that seems like a perfect way to end today. I want to say a huge thank you um, to Molly Peacock for being here with us and sharing a little bit about what I, I'm sure we're all going to want to read more in your book and to understand this complicated and beautiful story that you've invested so much time in. Um, um, I, 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 I'm hoping, Abby, that you will, um, I'm, I'm going to do one last screen share um, to end this that has the links to uh, bookshop.org the best place for Americans to buy this book is to go to bookshop.org um, because if you buy it through bookshop, um, it, the, an American, a small independent bookstore, the corner bookstore gets credit for everything you buy through bookshop.org. So I hope, and that it's at a discount. Um, so I hope you, if you don't have this book, um, you can go there to find it and Canadians, please buy the book through the AGO shop. Um, the AGO shop is the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario Museum shop. And it's great to be able to um, just give a little boost to a Canadian museum, just give a little boost to an Indian American bookstore and find Flower Diary. Perfect. Thank you. I put a link in the chat too to that. Thanks. So please check it out. And thank you all so, so much for being here with us. We hope to see you again soon. Thanks, thank, Molly. Thank, thank, thank you. And thanks to all of the people I didn't have a chance to shout. Oh, there's Dan Simpson. Another, uh, another. I'm, if you will just let me, 